Um, thanks for organizing this. I'm enjoying it already so much. Um, I'm Roshan. Uh, I'm uh, based at the Donders Institute um, in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, give you a bit of, uh, I guess, already historical uh, <laughs> overview of um, primarily dopamine's role in human cognition. Uh, it's a bit of overlap with uh, what you've heard from Trevor. It's not surprising because I did my PhD with uh, Trevor starting 20 years ago. I'll also refer to serotonin as promised in the abstract, but I noticed that there are several other sessions this week on serotonin, for example, by Zach, and the dopamine story is complex enough, so um, I'll focus on that. Um, Here's a picture of, uh, of my group. <coughs> Lieke is, uh, is a PhD student. Uh, where is she? Over there. Um, so she will uh, present a poster actually outlining some of the ongoing work. So if I don't get to that at the end of this session, then the, go and see uh, Lieke, because she'll tell you about the work we're doing right now, which follows on directly from this, this other work. Now, our overarching aim of, uh, of our work is to understand the mechanisms, neurochemical mechanisms of uh, the will, if you say. So that includes in cognitive neuroscience ter terms, uh, cognitive control, choice, and motivation. Um, and to do that, we adopt an interventional approach in people combining psychopharmacology uh, with cognitive science, uh, fMRI, and neurochemical PET. Um, looking at the dopamine system uh, primarily. Um, and it might be good to contextualize some of this work by starting uh, or I guess restating some of the uh, main principles of chemical neuromodulation and I'll refer to this as we go along. Uh, first, uh, you've heard this already but I think it's important enough to, to repeat uh, neuromodulatory pathways innervate multiple neural regions with different chemical needs, uh, with different optimal levels of neurotransmitter. These systems are dynamic and self-regulate to maintain equilibrium, both at the molecular and the systems level. Um, and they express the law of initial value. We'll talk a lot about this baseline dependency principle that uh, Trevor also referred to. Um, now I'll focus on the dopamine system, as I said, in the human brain. Um, and the importance of dopamine for cognitive control and uh, motivation, of course, is illustrated by the fact that um, many disorders that implicate dopamine are accompanied by cognitive control or impulse control deficits, ADHD, Parkinson's disease, and of course the various addictions. And most of these uh, disorders can be treated with dopaminergic drugs. Um, we can manipulate dopamine in the human brain in many different ways. Um, I'll uh, talk about some work we've done with patients with Parkinson's disease where we've looked at effects of uh, um, withdrawing dopaminergic medication, L-DOPA, the precursor of dopamine. I'll tell you about uh, work in, in healthy people um, where we administer uh, dopaminergic drugs um, and we look at this e the effects of such drugs as a function of uh, baseline levels of dopamine synthesis capacity, which we can measure with uh, F-DOPA PET, for example. Um, so in healthy volunteers, uh, you know, young students, uh, we use various drugs, including D2 receptor agonists that are used uh, to treat Parkinson's disease, um, but also sulpiride antipsychotic, both have high affinity for in particular the D2 receptor acting both post and presynaptically. Um, then we are also currently doing a lot of work with, um, with methylphenidate, which of course is a much dirtier drug. It also increases uh, dopamine transmission, but also noradrenaline, uh, among other things. But it's a very powerful modulator, uh, powerful drug. Uh, probably because it acts on so many different systems. It acts by blocking uh, the dopamine transporter um, so that more dopamine is available in the synapse. Uh, okay, so dopamine modulates multiple systems and therefore multiple functions. Uh, probably the best known 
uh, contribution of dopamine is, is to, um, to reward-based learning and choice. But uh, in uh, the second part of, of this talk, I'd like to also talk about this other important contribution of dopamine uh, to working memory and cognitive control. And I'll finish, hopefully, by an attempt to integrate these two uh, relatively separate lines of work um, and show that dopamine might well have a role in uh, learning and making decisions about whether or not to exert cognitive control. Um, I can use this, I think, it might be more calm. Um, okay, so let me begin with, um, well, yeah, I've said this already. So throughout the talk, I'll come back to four different points I'd like to make. First point um, is that of baseline dependency. So we see a lot of individual variation in dopaminergic drug effects with some people benefiting and other people's being impaired by the same drug. And we see, uh, and that might be accounted for by baseline dependency, but we see such baseline dependency also within the same individual, as you will see. And that's partly a function of task dependency. So different tasks have distinct neural signatures characterized by different optimal levels of dopamine. A third point I want to highlight, uh, something also highlighted by, uh, by Trevor, is neurochemical specificity. So effects of these dopaminergic drugs differ qualitatively from um, manipulations uh, that affect other major neuromodulators, like serotonin in particular. I'll illustrate this point uh, by showing that uh, effects of dopamine are really quite different from effects of serotonin on the same tasks. And the final point I want to make is that there are, there are multiple neurocognitive routes, if you will, through which drugs can alter cognition. So you might see the same effect as a result of the modulation of different systems, different neurocognitive pathways, if you will. Okay, so the first point I want to make is that about baseline dependency. Um, huge variability in both the direction and extent of dopaminergic drug effects, depending on baseline levels of dopamine in the neural system on which they act. Can be different individuals, can be different neural systems within the same individual. Um, I'll illustrate that with a, a line of work I started with Trevor on Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's disease, huh, we've heard that also from Martin, is characterized by uh, abnormalities in multiple uh, systems, not just dopamine, um, but the dopamine system is the, the most affected system. So 80% of dopamine neurons have to have died before Parkinson's symptoms emerge. And this, this dopamine, uh, this, this this death of dopamine neurons in the midbrain is not uniform. Yeah, so uh, the, the dopamine depletion starts in the ventral tier and then progresses over time to the dorsal tier of the substantia nigra. And as a result of that, uh, the ventral or limbic parts of the striatum and strongly connected cortical structures are relatively intact in the earliest stages of the disease. It's the dorsal parts of the striatum and the strongly connected dorsolateral parts of the cortex, frontal cortex, that are most severely affected, huh? leading to the motor symptoms and also some cognitive deficits. Um, that's just making the same point. Huh? There is a, a spatial temporal progression of dopamine depletion in Parkinson's disease with dopamine levels being severely depleted in the dorsal parts, but relatively intact in the ventral uh, frontostriatal circuits. Now, the severely depleted dopamine levels can be remedied uh, to some degree by dopamine-enhancing medication like levodopa and dopamine receptor agonists, bromocryptine, for example. Um, and these are known to remedy some motor difficulties. They can also improve some forms of cognitive rigidity uh, and working memory deficits, uh, but they may, in fact, impair other cognitive functions. Um, and indeed, we see that medication in Parkinson's disease can contribute to some severe psychiatric abnormality like impulse control disorder, hypersexuality, punding. Um, uh, and um, uh, Trevor and I and uh, Rachel Swainson 
uh, based on some earlier work by Gotham, put forward this, uh, this dopamine overdose hypothesis to account for these contrasting effects of medication uh, on cognition. And this, um, let me just skip this same point. And this overdose hypothesis was grounded in this observation from work with experimental animals showing that both too little and too much dopamine receptor stimulation can be bad for cognitive performance. There's an optimal level of dopamine receptor stimulation um, for, in this case, working memory performance. And that dopamine overdose hypothesis states that medication doses that are necessary to remedy the dopamine lack in the dorsal striatum may overdose any area where dopamine levels are relatively intact, such as the ventral striatum. We wanted to test this, uh, this hypothesis, and to do that, we uh, designed a, a neuropsychological study uh, where we um, submitted a group of patients with Parkinson's disease um, uh, to a number of tasks, some um, associated primarily with ventral frontostriatal circuitry and some associated primarily with dorsal frontostriatal circuitry. And we tested these people um, off medication, uh, so after withdrawal for about 18 hours, uh, so 18 hours uh, they were off their medication uh, or on their medication, their usual regimen. So we didn't do a placebo controlled design in this case, uh, but we, we assessed the effects of withdrawing medication. And we predicted that medication would um, improve performance on these dorsal tasks, but impair them on the ventral tasks. Um, and I just want to um, uh, show you the, the sort of ventral frontostriatal task, if you will, because we will talk about that a lot more. Uh, so in this particular study, we looked at probabilistic reversal learning. Very simple tasks. People are showing two patterns uh, on the screen, computer screen. One of them is associated with reward on most trials. In this case, the, the blue pattern, the other one with, uh, with punishment. So that's an abstract feedback. So if they choose the, the good one, they get a, a positive feedback, well done, and a nice beep. And if they get the, the negative one, they get a, a, a smile, you know, a cryy face and a, a nasty sound. Uh, nothing more than that. The key bit here is that after a number of correct trials, the contingencies reverse so that now people have to stop responding to the previously rewarded stimulus and start responding to the previously punished stimulus. So they have to adapt their responding, adapt their behavior based on changes in the reward punishment contingency. And this is a a task that is well known to implicate the orbitofrontal cortex and also the ventral striatum. So we anticipated that medication would impair performance paradoxically on this task. Um, that's what we saw. I'm showing you that here in this right panel. We also administered a, a task switching paradigm. Won't go into the details for, for today, but it's a paradigm that we know implicates dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal cortex, as well as dorsal parts of the striatum severely affected, so we anticipated beneficial effects. That's what we see. So um, here on the y-axis is uh, reaction times on switch and non-switch trials. So the, the key switch cost uh, is the slope, is representing the slope of this line. So patients off medication, they have a steeper slope, so they had greater difficulty with switching between tasks. And that switch deficit was rem remedied by dopaminergic medication. So patients on their medication performed much better than patients off medication. On this critical reversal learning paradigm, though, we saw the opposite pattern. So that was a double dissociation, where the same patients that performed well on the task switching paradigm actually failed to complete this reversal, this reward punishment based reversal stage. There was no problem, no difference between groups on an initial acquisition stage, but when they had to adapt their behavior, now most, you know, many more people on medication failed to obtain learning criterion compared with patients off medication. Yeah, please. Do, do you think that the, in the, the task switching uh, task, how much, of, how much it can be accounted for by uh, motor initiation? Yeah, it's a good point. The question is whether their motor slowing motor problems contribute to the switch cost, it cannot. So we looked at that very carefully. You can see here on the non-switch trials, there was no difference. So any sort of general motor slowing would express itself also on non-switch trials where the motor responses are matched. But we worried about that a lot, so, um, so it's a good point. But it's controlled here. <laughs> 
the, the error rate, very low error rate here. There was no effect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we concluded from this that dopaminergic medication in PD enhances cognitive uh, function by acting probably on the severely depleted, at least that was the hypothesis that was raised from this neuropsychological study, that uh, it enhances cognitive function by acting on the depleted dorsal striatum while impairing function by acting on the relatively intact ventral striatum. This is a neuropsychological behavioral study, so we followed this up with neuroimaging work, an fMRI study, where we could really test this hypothesis and assess the neural <laughs> mechanism underlying this medication-induced impairment. Um, and so we adapted the probabilistic reversal paradigm so that we can use it in the scanner. People now reverse multiple times. Uh, and we were specifically interested in this final reversal error event type where they switched responding to the newly rewarded stimulus. And we compared that with a baseline of correct rewarded responding. Um, this is just the main effective task. So as predicted, we see um, uh, a network of uh, bold signal in ventral parts of the frontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex here, um, as well as uh, some effects in the ventral striatum. Um, now, most interesting for us was the effect of medication, of medication withdrawal. That's presented here on the y-axis in the ventral striatum, um, huh? relatively intact, and in the dorsal striatum. Um, so basically what I've plotted is data extracted in this left panel from this, uh, this uh, cluster just for illustration purposes. And what you can see is that dopaminergic medication altered activity in the ventral stratum during reversal learning, but not in the dorsal stratum, um, just as would be predicted by that uh, L-DOPA uh, overdose or dopamine overdose hypothesis, I should say. Uh, so just to uh, unpack that, off medication, uh, patients exhibited this reversal-related increase in signal in the ventral striatum, as one would have predicted from animal work, um, but that signal was disrupted when L-DOPA uh, was um, administered. Um, well, so in a proportion of patients, you see, of course, major abnormalities. Yeah? You see ICDs, um, although this is often detected by partners, or reported at least by par partners. Um, uh, but they, in my experience, didn't complain that much about their cognitive uh, deficits if the ICD hadn't been developed, right? So what we think is that this might be a mechanism that might underlie uh, more severe uh, problems, uh, but they're quite subtle, and for that we would need these kind of subtle neurocognitive measures to uncover those. Yeah. Whether we assayed the medication effects in other regions, yes, we also did whole brain exploratory because this was a very kind of hypothesis-driven region of interest approach. But of course, we also did the exploratory whole brain uh, analysis, and there was no, no significant effect. Yes, yes, those effects were really selective for the basal ganglia, for the striatum. Yeah. Were you able to see that with higher doses of lipdopa that they would? increasingly get worse in this course, but, yeah. but did you not explore that? Um, so we haven't done that in this study. In more recent study, which I'm not presenting, uh, this is a study in like 700 patients. Um, we uh, were unable to do a withdrawal uh, in that study, so there's also another caveat there, but we did see a dose-related impairment in reversal learning uh, in 700 patients. And that did not extend to this other form of shifting that we talked about, attentional set shifting. Huh? That kind of analysis, of course, is confounded by disease severity and other things. But it was quite a selective dose-dependent reversal deficit, really strengthening this, uh, this overdose hypothesis. Yeah. Medication? Yeah. All Parkinson. Yeah, these were all relatively early. 
So we, we, did, we did not look at the more severely affected patients here because the hypothesis concerned the mildly affected patients. Um, you raise an interesting, implicitly, uh, an interesting question because what follows from this is that more severely affected people might not show these detrimental effects. Um, I don't know if that's true. Uh, so in follow-up work, we are assessing this now. The rest of the talk won't deal with that. But what we see is that ICDs are uh, co-occurring with dyskinesias. There's some comorbidity with depression. Uh, so there's some interesting psychiatric and, uh, and motor comorbidity there, suggesting that actually these overdose effects might exacerbate once the disease progresses. Possibly, perhaps, hypothetically, because with progression, it's also the, the presynaptic system that's affected so that there's no capacity for regulation, auto-regulation of these dopamine levels. But this is not, we don't really have solid evidence for this. This would involve a form of a revision of this overdose hypothesis. Um, but that would be something for the next summer school. But we haven't tested uh, whether the more severely affected people uh, show less or greater uh, effects. Partly because once they're really severely affected, they're wheelchair bound and can't do these quite sophisticated tasks, right? It's a difficulty with Parkinson work. So Yeah. How would uh, we haven't done that, so can't say that. Yeah, we think that uh, the agonists, the D3 receptor agonists, play a, a key role. So there's been some some of the follow-up work that I will show shows that these detrimental effects are primarily seen in people on primipexel and ropinorol, uh, and that's also true true for the ICDs, by the way. Yeah. I didn't catch that. Say that once more. So you mean, I mean, so you did, so did, did the change in, in the ventral ventral striatum. In bold, so, the bold. Mm -hmm. so, so which means that there is a, 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 an upregulated alteration for alpha in ventral striatum. And no, what we see in this study is that off medication, there is a reversal related signal. The ventral striatum of people off medication responds to reversal, is involved in, it cares about reversal learning. And that's what one would expect from animal work. So if you lesion the ventral striatum, animals can't do this task. So that's what we think is normal. We've also seen that, by the way, in healthy volunteers. Now, if you give the medication, that's disrupted. We haven't done this over time, if that's the question. No. Yeah, Trevor. I can, I can add to this a little bit yeah. to, to address one of the questions about severity. Yeah. So the, there's a parallel phenomenon going on here as well. If one looks at the genetics of these patients, so this morning I mentioned catecholamethyl transferase, and you remember that that affected frontal functions for dopamine, and it was discovered in Cambridge by a group of Roger Barker and others that those patients with metallics who had more frontal dopamine tend to do worse cognitively than the ones with valvular valves early in the disease. Early in the disease, in the frontal lobe, there's no regulation of frontal dopamine. And if you end up talking that old dopamine, you may again have too much. Mm -hmm. So that's another example, possibly, of an overdose hypothesis, yep. which may or may not be related to these phenomena, we don't know yet. However, the interesting thing is that a basin, Carolyn Williams-Lamb with Roger Barker, studied these patients for five years, 
and found that over five years, the met met patients got better, cognitively, presumably as their frontal dopamine went down, and the valve valves got worse as their frontal dopamine went down, do you see? Suggesting that they're moving along this inverted U-shaped function. But that's the example where more severe disease, yep, yep. bizarrely, in this particular aspect, not in their motor function, which got worse, but in this particular function, the cognition got a bit better. Yeah, yeah. Maybe the so they is talking off medication instead of taking alcohol. No, so the desert. Making it worse, put it that way. Particularly in male patients. Yeah, but your point was that the detrimental effect decreases with severity. Yes, yes. Yeah, and that, that's for the frontal function, and that, that, that's of interest. Uh, it would be really interesting to see whether the same story holds for the ventral striatum, yeah. given also the comorbidity between depression and ICDs, where depression is associated with limbic dopamine abnormality, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a number of open questions here that have clinical implication that are important to be addressed, even though it's an old... A uh, story that started a long time ago. We, we need to pursue this, I think, still. Yeah. It just shows you how complicated Parkinson's disease is, as we heard also in Parkinson's. So what we can get from this seems to be very convincing theory. So there is a way to translate this knowledge in a therapeutical way to treat this patient. I mean, to just give them a more localized dopamine replacement, like just in Spain where they need it more. So they yeah, yeah, and the interesting thing is that today, um, people, uh, patients are much better um, uh, tailored. The medication is better tailored to the individual because people, neurologists, are much more aware of this phenomenon. I think that is a direct result of of this research that has been done. So, people who dis you know who admit they dis they develop these problems, ICDs. Uh, yeah, of course, then the medication dose is reduced and it helps, and particularly the D3, the D3 agonists. And as a result of these discoveries, people have also started to adjust their medication prescriptions. Yeah, mostly by changing the doses because people who can't move, you know. Yeah, that'd be good. Well, remember, there was a technique called neural transplants, where they put neonatal dopamine cells into the dorsal strata. For some patients it worked, other patients it didn't work. Maybe James can say something. Yeah, James wants to say something. And then no, no, no. I'll just comment on this particular issue, because at the moment we get neither dopamine therapy induced or exacerbated ICD. The only treatment available is just to pull back the dopamine drive. People go off and they hate it. People quite like being a bit high, a bit of a buzz you get from yes. the dopamine over. Overdose, and they don't have insight, the catastrophic effect of gambling and hypersexuality and so on. Um, so then they really don't like coming off those, those dopamine drugs. Right. Um, so the, but that's all we have. So at the moment, we need to have other treatments. Now, you might want to say we have to motorically leave that higher dopamine dose but use another agent, norgenergic perhaps, or serotonergic, to, to offset that, that impulsivity. Or you have to get more dopamine made the right part of the striatum and not elsewhere. And that would either come down to sort of fit stem transplants, which um, are slightly on the back foot but are still going ahead in some centres. Another way is to use like an inactivated rabies virus to, tra um, to transfer a uh, type of hydroxamide, selectively the striatum to promote local dopamine synthesis in the dorsal striatum where yeah. you need it, and therefore not have to pharmacologically, systemically overload that yeah. striatum. But these are experimental. But the other thing that uh, might have potential is to look at more <coughs> slow release versions of medication. Because, as I will uh, talk about next, the temporal specificity of the transients might play a role in some of these detrimental effects. And what we see that there is, there is preparations, uh, subcutaneous um, delivery, for example, where the idea is, but we need work on this. Is that the detrimental effects are much less? And it's on off, particularly the soluble forms of levodopa that seem to be particularly right. likely to do with dysregulation and gambling. Yeah. I want to keep patients further, they don't like slow release tablets, they don't get that uh, affected element that you do with uh, a slow release tablet or, or with a duodopa in the, the gut. Um, so it's, it's a real problem to have this in practice. Yeah.
Okay, I want to move on to the second point. Oh, there's more questions. Are you counting? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, sometimes uh, he is also treated with brain stimulation. Right. Um, do you know if anything is known about the effects of that uh, into the uh, brain? Yes. Um, yeah. So. Um, Oh, there's so much to say about this. That's another lecture, actually. Um, I guess uh, there's also problems, impulse control problems, behavioral control problems with DBS in a certain proportion of patients. Not surprising because, because this SCN, subthalamic nucleus, is not just connected to the motor circuit, but also to other circuits. Uh, the nature of these deficits, though, seems to be somewhat different. Uh, there's a lot of work, a lot of people working on the role of the STN in impulse control these days. And that seems to be more of a decision conflict type of problem. Um, and I will leave it to that, actually, for now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you touch on an interesting point in general, which actually led me to, led us to look also at the role of serotonin, for example. So one question that uh, I asked, uh, well, one observation I made is that some of these detrimental effects of medication resemble effects of serotonin depletion. Um, yeah, that's, uh, and, and there is that observation that dopamine might be released from serotonin neurons. Um, I'll come to that. Those effects are different. Serotonin depletion is, is quite different from, does something quite different from uh, these effects of medication. So there is some specificity. Yeah, that's the third point I wanted to make. Yeah. I just wanted to comment that, like, aside from DBS and you know, stem cell patients, there's quite an arsenal of things that clinicians can use to manipulate our Parkinson's disease, for example. It's, there's, you know, pumped antagonists, there are now inhibitors, there are but I think like many clinicians from you know, the neurology experience that I've seen and don't have a very good understanding of how to use them. There is always some sort of a regimen that you put on first and then you titrate yeah. the effects later with yeah. by adding dopamine agonists, etc. But there, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done by informing clinicians right. of the theory of the right. Like, like with antibiotics, by the way, same sort of antibiotics also start with the, the, the top on the list, right? It's not that different. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so the second point I want to make, I mean, you know, I think there was, uh, is this a short question? Just a, yeah, a really simple question. Um, what brain structure you mean with ventral and dorsal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, um, the, um, the effects that we saw in this fMRI study was really centered on the accumbens. Um, but uh, in general, when I say ventral striatum, I don't just mean the accumbens, also the ventromedial parts of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. Uh, and we've actually done quite recently some um, parcellation of the striatum based on uh, intrastriatal connectivity, maybe we've seen that, and it really falls very nicely based on resting state connectivity. Uh, yeah, no, 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 we, 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 we don't have the resolution with this work to look at the differences between core and shell, which though is very, very important, but I, based on this work, we don't have that control, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. Um, Let's see. Um, so the, the second point um, I want to make, and it was illustrated to some degree in the, in the studies I've shown you so far, was, is that drugs that, uh, that uh, affect dopamine can have contrasting effects also within the same individual, depending on task demands and associated optimal levels of dopamine. And not just on associated baseline levels of dopamine, but different functions um, so, you know, have different optimal levels of dopamine. Um, and I want to illustrate this with uh, a study that followed from the prior work uh, 
um, where we asked the question, the next question, which was what psychological mechanism might underlie this medication-induced deficit in reversal learning? Um, now, I bet you all know this, this slide. Um, we know that uh, uh, um, yeah, based on extensive evidence from single cell recording work, uh, we know that dopamine bursts, these phasic dopamine bursts, or maybe I should say transients, positive transients, code uh, positive prediction errors, reward prediction errors, uh, and these phasic dips code for negative reward prediction errors. I'm not going to go into great detail, assuming you all know this. Um, um, these, these dopamine neurons project to large parts of the brain, in particular also the basal ganglia. Uh, what do these basal ganglia do? Well, there's two, uh, two answers, different answers to this question. One is um, these basal ganglia do not directly implement anything. They don't do anything. The other answer is they do everything, <laughs> right? So uh, they modulate activity in multiple cortical areas affecting motor programming, uh, learning, motivation, decision-making, cognitive control. Um, again, you've heard about this earlier, but an interesting observation is that um, dopamine can have contrasting effects on activity in the basal ganglia pathways by acting on uh, D1 and D2 receptors, uh, respectively. Um, so increases in dopamine um, can actually um, potentiate activity in the direct basal ganglia pathway by stimulating D1 receptors, uh, whereas increases in dopamine actually inhibit activity in this indirect so-called no-go pathway, uh, basal ganglia pathway, uh, by acting on D2 receptors. And now activity in these two respective pathways have opposite effects on cortical activity, uh, where activation of um, of direct pathway MSN, so direct pathway striatal neurons, disinhibit cortical activity, whereas activation of indirect pathway neurons, these D2 neurons, actually um, inhibit cortical activity. So dopamine has opposite effects uh, through these two pathways, ultimately on cortical activity. Um, that led people like Randy O'Reilly and Michael Frank to propose a computational model uh, where uh, um, basal ganglia gating of, um, of cortical responses occurs in proportion to the relative probability of positive negative outcomes of different actions which are learned through dopamine. Um, specifically, according to this modeling work, uh, separate striatal populations, go and no-go populations, code for positive and negative action values that are learned through dopamine, with positive reward prediction errors, enhancing activity in a go pathway, uh, strengthening rewarded actions, while negative reward prediction errors associated with these dopamine dips enhance activity in the no-go pathway, weakening punished actions. Um, so I think these people actually did a really great job at synthesizing various pieces of evidence coming from electrophysiology and work that had been known for a long time. They integrated in this nice, uh, in this nice model, um, putting forward this hypothesis that increases in dopamine might potentiate learning from reward, but actually impair learning from punishment. And we can understand that in the context of this anatomical arrangement of these different pathways. Okay, so that leads then, led us to propose or to, to hypothesize that these detrimental effects on learning might reflect excessive impact by medication of reward, but reduced impact of punishment. You can imagine that if you have to change your behavior in this task and you've you know, had been influenced a lot by reward, it's really hard to let go of that previously rewarded action. And if you've now, because of this medication, also become insensitive to punishment, you won't really learn that this rewarded action that's become really prepotent is now no longer correct. Yeah? So we would expect perseveration based on this model. Uh, to assess this, I decompose this reversal learning paradigm into two conditions, 
one in which reversals were signals by unexpected rewards, by rewards prediction errors, and one in which reversals were signaled to the patient by unexpected punishments, by negative reward prediction errors. And I predicted that medication would have opposite effects on these two, potentiating reward-based reversal, but impairing punishment-based reversal. Yes. Can this model explain conditioning and punishment? Yeah. Yeah, it can explain opposite effects of medication on reward on appetitive conditioning and aversive conditioning. It's making the point that you can convert a task through two different mechanisms, either by attending to reward or to punishment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's about conditioning. It's about learning, conditioning, association learning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what, how do we do that? We have to, here is a slightly adapted paradigm representing subject with two patterns. Uh, one of them is associated with uh, a punishment and the other one is associated with reward abstract, positive, negative feedback. The subject doesn't choose between the two patterns. The computer chooses, yeah. Uh, by, and then highlights one of the two pictures. And the subject then has to predict whether the stimulus is going to give them a reward or whether it's going to give them a punishment. If they predict punishment, they press the red button. If they predict reward, they press the green button. So in this case, they have to press the red button because that stimulus was followed after a few seconds by punishment. They learn this by trial and error because they, they see one picture highlighted, they try one of the buttons, and then they see the actual outcome. So they s check their own response based on the outcome. It's like the weather prediction task. Some people know this better. It's a bit similar, except now with reward and punishment. Um, the key thing is that these contingencies reverse, um, but now based on either unexpected reward or based on unexpected punishment. So here, the unexpected reward condition, people have learned that this landscape is followed by, um, by punishment and the face by reward. Now, on the key trial, the landscape is highlighted and is now followed unexpectedly by reward. And what we measure is performance on the next trial, and we assess whether people update their predictions and say, oh, landscape, no reward. You know, I've updated my predictions because I've seen on the previous trial it's followed by reward rather than punishment. Sorry, is it, uh, is the reward or punishment yeah. deterministic? Yeah, this, parada this paradigm is fully pr uh, deterministic. It's interesting. It's, it was a bit counterintuitive, but uh, we have sufficient error rates uh, because really to make it stochastic um, would make it way too difficult. Deter yeah, de so the same stimulus was followed by reward on every trial, so there was no kind of misleading outcomes. So 100% association, stimulus, landscape, punishment. Yeah, and then that reverse, right? Yeah. Yeah. All pretend. Hypothetical. It's a better word. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering why did you choose to, to make a predict, to, so to report the prediction to choose the paradigm? Yeah, because if you have them choose, as in the original paradigm, as a reversal, um, performance on the reversal trial can only be signaled to subject by unexpected punishment. Um, that's only when they start to explore. So, of course, in a stochastic, you're used to much more stochastic random uh, walks, people explore a lot. But in these paradigms and also in the sort of 80 20 that we've been using originally, very little exploration. Eh? People just go with the, with the figure pattern A until they see something changes, they go for pattern B. It's not very habitual. It's not very, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can't predict the reversal. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this, this, you say this is deterministic, but by, by the participant, it would actually be experienced as probabilistic, wouldn't it? Because it would just be like, I mean, if, 
if you would just say, it would just be like, maybe this 90, 90, or something like that. I don't know how, how often you see these like surprises. Yeah, yeah. So, but they know that if they're surprised, it's fully informative. So they know that if it's they're surprised, they should switch. They, they know that. Yeah, yeah. They don't always do that because of their prepotency, but they, they do. So here's the error rate. There's quite a bit of errors, actually. Uh, for the um, switch trials after unexpected punishment and the switch trials after unexpected reward. Control subjects, they don't perform very differently between the two conditions. Uh, but patients with Parkinson's disease who are on their medication, they have a selective difficulty with reversing based on unexpected punishment. Whereas actually their reward-based reversal is not so much affected. Uh, patients off their medication show, if anything, the opposite pattern, right? So here, this was then consistent with that computational framework where increases in dopamine uh, would bias the system away from punishment-based learning towards reward-based learning. Um, and indeed, this was also now shown in many other studies. I think this is one of the better replicated observations in this complex field. So these are just two data sets from Michael Frank, um, which actually inspired this development, this decomposition of the reversal. And actually it's flipped with positive reward on the left and punishment negative on the right. Don't worry about the details here. The point is the same pattern was shown here with medication biasing the system away from punishment towards reward-based learning. That's what it says here. Okay, so next I want to illustrate a different approach to studying dopamine's role. Um, and that's by uh, exploiting individual variation in the healthy population. Yeah, yeah. I have this question on that piece. So based on that data, can you also disentangle whether that would be the direct or indirect pathway? Or? Well, hypothetically, we would assign the effect of dopamine medication on reward to the di direct, the GO pathway, the D1 mediated GO pathway, and the effects on, on punishment to the indirect no-go pathway, but that's theoretical so far. It will be cool to, to start to uh, assess these, yeah, maybe work with decoding or, or pattern classification to see, because these neurons are all intermingled in the striatum. Eh? So even with fMRI, that's very hard to do. Yeah. yeah. I'm People. sorry, I just want to make sure I understand that's okay. Because um, I know you say that high level dopamine is that you, you learn better from reward uh, but not from punishment. Worse from punishment, yeah. Yes. Mm, but then you would predict the opposite, huh? Eh? Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm trying to match that because that's kind of what I see in some other different data. Oh. Sort of other side of things. Mm. And then I don't know, but well, that's one explanation I was sort of thinking. Yeah. So this original account goes as follows. Actually, with more L-DOPA, eh, you, you synthesize more dopamine. So with the stimulus-induced uh, response will be potentiated. Uh, but uh, a dip is kind of filled in. You know, if you give L-DOPA sustained levels, it's not a transient, it's sustained and it's filled in, so there's just actually no room. That's the account that was provided. But I'd love to talk to you later about your data, yeah. I want to pursue this, uh, this, this, this other work that we did in healthy people um, with uh, an anti-Parkinson drug. So we wanted to see whether some of these negative effects um, generalized to the healthy population so here we gave a low dose of a D2 receptor agonist. It's not completely clean, but it has high affinity for the D2 receptor. Um, stimulates it. Uh, placebo controlled this time, double blind, using the exact same paradigm I just described to you. Um, given this well-known nonlinear relationship between receptor stimulation and performance, we thought we should take into account the baseline state of the system if we want to isolate any effects, right? Um, so in order to do that, we um, um, obtained from our students um, uh, PET scans, FMT PET scans, fluorometatyrosine. It's a bit like, actually like FDOPA, substrate of uh, dopamine synthesis capacity. So what you see here is uptake of this ligand, FMT, 
uh, in the striatal terminals of midbrain dopamine neurons, there was quite a lot of variability in this healthy population. So these are healthy students, Berkeley students actually, with um, some people showing a lot of high uptake and some people showing relatively low uptake. And we looked at the effects of bromocryptine as a function of baseline levels of synthesis capacity on this task um, using this, this paradigm. Now here uh, are the data from the placebo session. So on the y-axis is, um, uh, is a different score. So that's um, the number of er so error rate on the re reward condition minus the punishment condition. So high scores represent um, um, Actually, so it's not error rate, accuracy. High scores represent good learning from reward versus punishment. Low scores represent good learning from punishment versus reward. So what you can see is that there is a linear relationship with striatal dopamine synthesis capacity with low dopamine subjects being better at learning from reward than at learning from, uh, learning from punishment, sorry, than from reward and high dopamine subjects being better at learning from rewards than from punishment. So there's a positive relationship between dopamine synthesis capacity in the striatum and the degree to which you learn from reward versus punishment. Yeah? Did, uh, did they have a difference in the dopamine transporter? We don't know. We don't know. There might be some interaction there, some compensatory interaction possible. We don't know. Uh, but we were primarily interested, of course, in the effects of bromocryptine. And that's plotted here. So this is the uh, effect of bromocryptine minus placebo on reward versus punishment-based reversal learning. Um, what I'm plotting is um, drug-induced improvement in reward learning. So high scores represent potentiation, improvement in reward learning versus punishment learning. What you can see is that the low dopamine subjects, they got better in terms of reward learning versus punishment learning from bromocryptine, whereas the high dopamine subjects, they actually got worse uh, with bromocryptine. Right? So that's actually consistent with its inverted U-shaped relationship, where people on the left are on the left side of this curve, you know, moving towards the optimum, whereas people on the right side of this graph, probably on the optimum, moving down towards the supraoptimal parts of that curve. Okay. Interim conclusion: Bromocryptine improved reward versus punishment-based reversal in low dopamine subjects. By contrast, the same drug impaired reward versus punishment learning in high dopamine subjects. Oh, sorry. Pause. So if you would give the low dopamine subjects a much higher dose of this same substance, would they then tilt towards the other side? Perhaps. Hmm. Theoretically, yeah. Be pretty high. Yeah. But, uh, but, it, but it's not actually 100% uh, sure. So it's possible, but, um, but one possible account of these detrimental effects in the high dopamine subjects is because in the high dope is that in the high dopamine subjects the presynaptic D2 receptors are more sensitive. Uh, yeah, the system is ultimately geared towards homeostasis, so you you can imagine hypothetically uh, that uh, that a drug that acts on D2 receptors might act more readily on presynaptic receptors than prosynaptic receptors in high dopamine subjects relative to low dopamine subjects. If that is true, then you might not see that a higher dose also impairs performance in low dopamine subjects. Be interesting. Does the drug um, affect um, the performance of the high, high uh, dopamine volunteers when, when they perform in the reward picture? Like, do they worse, uh, perform worse uh, with the reward? Yes, they do. Okay. They do. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's opposite. So if you look at them separately for a reward of punishment separately, is that what you're asking? Yeah? Then you see these opposite correlations. But, the, but the, the, the thing is, we really like this contrast because it controls for non-specific effects. You can imagine that with a drug, you're more, I don't know, aroused, if I'm saying, or any of these non-specific effects of such drugs uh, might lead to a general 
I don't know, enhanced detection of an unexpected event that is not valence specific. We're controlling for that here by contrasting them. Yeah, 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 yeah. We want to do that. We want to look at that. But you know, um, uh, there is currently no D1 selective drug available for human research. People are beginning to to play around with it. Some people have access, but what would we predict? We would predict this actually the same. So if you stimulate D1 receptors. Uh, you would also potentiate activity in the GO pathway, enhancing reward learning, biasing the system to this GO. So, of course, if you increase dopamine, you stimulate D1 receptors and D2 receptors. It has opposite effects, um, but um, probably opposite effects on the GO and the no-GO pathway, biasing the system towards reward away from punishment. And what we would think is that the effects on reward would be greater for a D1 drug, and the effect on punishment would be greater for a T2 drug. But the direction of the difference, the difference would be the same. And I think the difference is best interpretable for, what I, for the reason I just gave. Um, so if we really want to disentangle D1 and D2 drugs, we would redesign the task and have control conditions for the reward and punishment conditions separately. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, are you, so are you saying that the perceived um, optimal level of dopamine for each individual should be different for all the individuals? The optimal levels of dopamine for reward and punishment are likely different. So an optimal level of dopamine for reward is likely higher than for punishment. Right, but from across uh, from one individual to another, it would be different because of the baseline difference? Yes, yes, that's what we're showing here. Yes. Yeah. I have sort of a, a practical question: uh, Is do do these people experience a lot of side effects? Like when you give them uh, very low dose? No, we don't really get side effects. Very, very, very little with bromocriptine. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite different. Eh? The Alzheimer's is quite different type of disorder from Parkinson's disease. Yeah. We, we haven't. Yeah. 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 In everyone, also in uh, patients with Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, mm, Trevor. In the early Alzheimer's disease, the patients are prepared on the Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question. Uh, you're, you're raising this interactive issue, and we, we don't know that, right? We don't know this, and I think it's, an, it's a wide open field. Um, you know, we've thought also about looking at interactions and about the states of the other systems, uh, but particularly in interventional work, it's, it's quite a challenge because you need to select the right doses to, to actually compare them. But I think it's a very important factor to take into account. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, from this from this uh, theoretical work underlying some of this um, uh, psychological behavioral study, we would uh, predict that the effects that we see of bromocriptine, um, but also of sulpiride, um, reflect modulation of dopamine receptors in the striatum. Now, as I said, bromocriptine is uh, is actually quite dirty. It has affinity for D2 receptors, but also for noradrenaline receptors. ND1 receptors and serotonin receptors even. Um, so we really were interested in assessing neurochemical specificity. And we were also interested in the locus of this effect. Uh, these, these, these models, these theoretical models, would really predict um, uh, 
a focus in the basal ganglia. Um, so to do that, we um, employed a pretreatment design uh, where we um, gave subjects bromocryptine, but we also gave them in a separate session um, sulpiride at the same time, so that um, theoretically zero effect would remain. Right? The idea would be that if you would pretreat um, subjects with a highly selective D2 receptor antagonist like sulpiride, you would block the D2 receptors and therefore stimulating D2 receptors with bromocryptine would have no additional effects. So the combined session we anticipated would look just like a placebo session. So four sessions here, subjects underwent placebo, bromocryptine, sulpiride and placebo plus bromocryptine. Plus, um, sorry, bromocryptine plus sulpiride. And to demonstrate a role for the stratum, we employed fMRI. Um, now, of course, again, we realized that we could only isolate those effects if we would take into account variation, individual variation in the baseline state of the system. In this particular study, we were unable, it was just infeasible to acquire PET scans. Um, so to, to get at this indirectly, we decided to stratify our drug effects by a proxy of dopamine, um, namely baseline working memory capacity. So in previous work, there's a kind of a whole history of work showing that um, the cognitive effects of dopamine drugs depend on working memory capacity. Uh, and indeed, working memory capacity correlates with dopamine synthesis capacity. That's been shown in two separate PET studies, uh, mm -hmm. measuring dopamine synthesis capacity. Positive correlation, high working memory capacity accompanied by high dopamine synthesis capacity. So this was the best we could do in this complex pharmacological design. Okay, same task. I don't have to go through that again. Um, oh, well, it's just... And here's the results. First point. The D2 drugs modulated, indeed, selectively, striatal bold signal during reversal learning at the time of these unexpected outcomes. Second point, we saw opposite effects of sulpiride blocking D2 receptors and bromocryptine stimulating due to D2 receptors. Here they're contrasted directly and you can see almost the entire striatum activated here. It's quite a nice effect. Third point is that the effect of sulpiride was indeed blocked by pretreatment of bromocryptine. Uh, so when we, when we compared sulpiride with the combined session, it looked just like the effect of sulpiride versus placebo. So this suggested to us that indeed these effects of these these drugs are mediated by D2 receptors in the stratum, as would predict it from that theoretical work. And, moreover, these effects varied across individuals as a function of that proxy of dopamine synthesis capacity, working memory capacity. So that, in this case, sulpiride reduced striatal bold signal in subjects with putatively low baseline levels of dopamine, increasing it in putatively high dopamine subjects. So here's the contrast between sulfuride and bromocryptine, between sulfuride and placebo, <laughs> and between sulfuride and the combined session. That's this. So, yeah, no, you anticipate the next slide. So that's an interesting que open question always. So to what degree do the drug effects on bold signal accompany drug effects on behavioral behavior? Uh, and, and that's what, uh, this is what we see. So what we see is that um, drug-induced increases in striatal bold signal were accompanied by drug-induced increases in reward versus punishment learning. So a potentiation of striatal bold signal, eh, which might parallel increase in dopamine, is accompanied by better reward learning and worse punishment learning. Yeah? 
Yeah. Yeah, do you know that was just lucky. Yeah, really, because, yeah, no, it was. It was such a risky study to do. It's such a risky study to do, you know, this work. But, but what we, we knew bromocryptine had certain effects. We knew that dose of sulfuride has effects. Uh, we have experience, uh, Trevor has experienced loads of experience with this kind of dose. Um, it's also the dose that's most feasible. We don't have that much choice. Trevor did a study with Chris uh, with a much higher dose. Uh, I think that was quite tricky. <laughs> Side effects, you get side effects, right? Extra pyramidal side effects. You don't have that much choice. It's hard to do dose response curves. So we went for the, for the dose that was most feasible and which we knew worked. And that's what we got, yeah, thankfully, yeah. Can we check also the functional connectivity changes before fluctuation and after fluctuation? Functional connectivity changes? Uh, yeah, we, we did, uh, we look at resting state connectivity in a separate study. Uh, so that was quite interesting where, um, you get D2 dependent uh, changes in uh, intrastriatal connectivity, actually. Uh, but uh, this is a different story, not for today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you speak up a bit? Sorry, people can turn. No, no. Well, so, the fee so in general, I'm personally a little bit skeptical of midbrain effects in bold but it's very vulnerable to artifacts, breathing artifacts and so on. So you really need to use special sequences to, and control for heart rate and all kinds of sort of physiological effects to, to rely on bold signal in the midbrain. So we tend to be very careful at looking at that in these standard sequences. Um, but also we didn't see it. We wouldn't have necessarily anticipated that here, um, but uh, we also didn't see it. But that's just a, no a note of warning that if you are interested in midbrain modulation for bold, then you know might consider a special sequences and controls. Yeah, we don't have much resolution. Huh? Yeah. This may be slightly off topic, but in this reversible learning pattern, would you expect in patients of depression to be more learning more from punishment? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you actually, we've seen that. We've used the task also in depression, and you see um, poor reward-based reversal learning and reduced ventral striatal bold signal. That was a study with Oli Robinson and uh, Barbara Sakian. Yeah. And we replicated that actually in a group of patients with Parkinson's disease and depression, the exact same effect. Yeah. Yeah. Is now a good time for coffee break? Um, let me check. I think so. Yeah, we can do that. I think that'd be a good, good idea. Yeah. Never gonna get through the whole session, but that's okay.